so excited to have you all with us. My name is Desmond Martin. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Next Phase STEM. And it is my very good pleasure to have you. This is an awesome opportunity for us to have you today um, to talk about culturally responsive um, education in STEM. Um, it is so, so critical for our students who are growing in their entire academic maturation to have the opportunities to build STEM identities. Um, we'll get into a little bit more about exactly what we mean when we say STEM identities and the kind of futures that we hope that our students will have. Um, but before we get started, I do want to jump into some house rules with regards to our webinar today. The first is that we are indeed in webinar mode. That means that while um, I'm sure that you have wonderful stage presence and that you have a beautiful speaking voice, we won't be either to hear you or speak with you. However, that does not mean that you are voiceless. Um, the chat functionality is open. Uh, just type in a little message to everybody. Uh, so is the Q&A functionality. Uh, that means that if you need uh, to give us some commentary, if you have any questions, uh, if you just have some feedback with what's going on during the course of our webinar, you are more than happy to jump in and let us know. Uh, the second piece of information is that we are recording today's webinar. That means that um, you'll have the opportunity to go back and view this as a resource. Um, we're sharing the slide deck as well. Um, if you have uh, any questions and want to dig into Louise some more, you can just email me and I'll be sure to get those questions back to you. Um, I'm seeing a couple of familiar faces in our attendees list, so it's really, really great to have you. Um, with that being said, we'll dig right in. Uh, a great place to begin is just at the beginning, an introduction of who I am. Uh, I mentioned before that I am the Chief Learning Officer here at Next Wave STEM. Uh, this is my face in color. You'll see on your screen my face in black and white. Uh, I've had the great opportunity to be with Next Wave STEM um, since almost the very beginning. Uh, as Chief Learning Officer, I'm responsible for professional development, um, curriculum design and rollout, um, product and project management with regard to our curricula. And uh, I bring to Next Wave STEM 10 years teaching. Uh, taught for some time in the Detroit Public School System, STEM, and, uh, and uh, actually computer science. Uh, and I did a little bit of ed tech supplementation on the side. Well, my formal background is in mechanical engineering. And the reason why I mention all of these things is that uh, we really do love getting into the week. We're always looking for educators like yourselves and those who are working in an industry to inform what we do when we talk about bringing STEM to new students. Uh, more than anything, I just love learning out with other educators. Uh, when we talk about who we are next wave STEM, um, we're talking about a young startup. We are almost four years old now, um, but more than anything, not focused on what you see on the slide, what we believe is that one of your students um, may be someone who helps save the world. Um, we understand fundamentally that we have a large, existential problems that we are facing um, in our societies and in our world today. Climate change is here, it's real. We have climate refugees here in the United States. Um, it doesn't matter if those problems are global, like climate change, or if they're local. You may have issues about how much traffic you have and whether or not you can adequately navigate um, to and from work and to your place of businesses. Um, you may have problems with potable drinking water. Um, you may have problems with your electoral systems or just being able to connect with um, basic internet services. We understand that these problems are multidimensional. Um, they are multi-layered and multifaceted. And we understand also that there are gonna be some robust technical solutions that are required in order to get to those solutions. Um, we also know that while we have many really skilled scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians working all over the world and all kinds of teams and across, and across multiple disciplines, um, consistently and persistently, data tells us that there are not enough qualified STEM 
individuals to help solve these problems, let alone fill in that demand for the workforce here in the United States. So we believe in changing outcomes for our young people. Mainly, that's by empowering you as educators. We know that students who are exposed to hands-on STEM earlier will see STEM outcomes later on in their uh, academic careers and later on in their professions. And the more competent, qualified technologists, engineers, and mathematicians we have working, um, the closer we get to some of those world-changing solutions. Um, to put it short, uh, we would love to empower the teachers of today to prepare students for the future. We do that a couple ways in next wave STEM. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of today's webinar. Um, but we do that through full tilt technology courses. Um, we like to say that we're a one stop shop. Um, courses in robotics and artificial intelligence, drones, and 3D printing, as well as some new courses that are coming in the future in cybersecurity, the Internet of Things, and many more. Uh, are going to give our students who might not have gotten hands on with emerging technology before the opportunity to do so now and moving forward in their academic careers. Our materials are NGSS and Common Core aligned, and they also support 21st century skills. Um, we want to make sure that this is something that your students will use and get them to some really great learning outcomes. So with all that great stuff being said, we wanna get down to the nitty gritty. And some of us may be asking this question, especially in the current climate of discussions around culturally responsive teaching, what culturally responsive teaching actually means. Um, we are seeing this word pop up more and more. Um, there's been a lot of robust research done over the past decades around culturally responsive teaching. And even today we're learning more about what that will mean in the context of STEM education for our students. But it's helpful to start with a definition. When we talk about culturally responsive teaching, um, we're talking about a mindset that locks something in at its core. Um, what we want to establish and hold on to as we're um, teaching to our students who have diverse cultures, maybe than our own, is that we are establishing a teaching pedagogy that recognizes and values the inclusion of students' own cultural references in all aspects of their learning. Um, this is a critical idea. Um, uh, an example that I bring up often is how important teamwork and even different cultural perspectives has been throughout the course of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in human history. Um, if we are thinking about the thousands of years of scientific exploration and the hundreds of thousands and millions of man and woman hours that allow us to have something even as uh, beautiful but as simple as a cell phone, um, what we have to acknowledge is that there is no one person alive today who could have done them that who could have done that work themselves. Um, there is no one country or continent um, that would be able to marshal those kind of resources um, to create the level of technology that we enjoy today. It's truly an interconnected exchange of knowledge. And our cultural understandings actually inform the conjectures that we make about scientific discovery our approaches to engineering, solving real world problems, and even how we conceptualize much more, um, much more abstract ideas than mathematics, exploring and learning more about the universe. Um, the differing complexities of human thought and cultural expression inform how we practice our STEM disciplines, inform how you look at the universe and how we apply that knowledge to solving problems. Um, culturally responsive teaching doesn't hobble our students by cutting off avenues of learning or stripping away any robustness of their learning. Um, what it does is it leverages the best of what human beings have been doing throughout history, taking in different ideas, different thought patterns, different expressions and ways of doing things, 
and taking the best of these things to get into the next best solution. So when we think about building a pedagogy that recognizes different cultural references, references different cultural expressions, um, we understand that our instruction must build on our students' prior knowledge and how much of that knowledge is rooted in cultural expression. Um, that goes with the idea of how we communicate and how we share ideas, even how we parse out responsibilities, um, but even our uh, observations about the natural world and how we build those cause and effect relationships it has to make reference um, and build on that prior knowledge that students have. But then we want to make sure that that instruction will actually reflect individual and cultural experiences. Our students should not engage with STEM learning from a lens that just recognizes one way of being in the world, um, that only recognizes one pathway, that only idolizes and celebrates one kind of hero, um, that recognizes one or only a small subset of different contributions that are made to STEM. Um, we want to make sure that this learning is real and applicable to students every day, every day their everyday lives. Basically, if we truly value our students, um, we've got to find ways and really be intentional about bringing their lived experience into our classroom. Not our lived experience, not the lived experience, the lived experiences of those who we think um, really serve even as great role models. That's, that's important, there's a place for that, but culturally responsive teaching sees the lived experiences of our students and brings those experiences into the classroom as well. So if we consider this really important idea in culturally responsive teaching, being that we have to bring in our students' lived experiences, it's helpful, um, not completely helpful, but really helpful to start identifying what that means, what are some of the different dynamics of the way people live and the way they express their culture? Um, what does that individual cultural reference look, look like? Um, it really varies and it depends on where you're teaching, who your student population is, even who you are. Um, that's as simple as considering country of or origin. And I'll go beyond that, even the country of origin of our students' parents the kind of cultural context with which they build at home. Um, whether or not your district is urban, suburban, um, exurban, um, or rural, um, that really informs not only um, the actual ways communities are formed, but even the way we think about day-to-day -day work and the application of solutions. Um, of course, race and ethnicity we have to consider but also the effect that many of our learners are multilingual. Um, and when I say multilingual, I'm talking, yes, traditional spoken languages, um, things like Romance languages or languages from the Global South, um, English, of course, but we're also considering um, dialect and vernacular. Um, the way that we are communicating in the 21st century is changing rapidly because of the pervasive change of dialect. Um, but even when we consider language, we're also considering technical languages. Um, where does AAVE meet Python? How do those things work together? How do they change and how do they continue to reform culture? Um, socioeconomic status is really, really important because throughout the course of history, we recognize um, that solutions, both economic and just purely technical, are are informed by the free market and our access to those technologies is also informed by the free market. So socioeconomic status does change, um, but so does physical ability. Um, and this goes hand in hand with um, exploration and the way that we need to use tools. Um, what are the limitations of our students? What limitations are we placing on our students that may be unjust? Um, what limitations can we overcome and what do we lose when we disable our students, where we create environments that they're not able to fully participate in? That same idea goes in with learning ability and also generation, knowing that our students aren't 
always going to be just young students. We are a generation of continual learners. Some of us on the line today may have not worked robustly with emerging technology ourselves. And so we have to go along with our students. Um, these points of cultural reference and this dialogue, this continuing dialogue we have as educators along with our students becomes so important over time. Um, so I, we, we've defined it, we, we've got some parameters, but we want to consider why culturally responsive teaching is important. And what's helpful to think about is the context in which we're in right now. When the brain encounters information, especially during the act of reading or learning, is searching to make connections to whatever is actually personally relevant and meaningful. And what is relevant and meaningful to an individual is based on his or her cultural frame of, of reference. Um, if many of us have been wondering about the struggle that our students have had connecting over the last 14, 15 months, if many of us are struggling to continue to connect over the last 14, 15 months, there are many, many things going on. But what lies at the heart of most of it is this idea of personal relevance and cultural connection. Um, and a big question that we won't answer today is what kind of learning cultures have we, have we formed? Have we been forced to form in the context of the pandemic? The idea here is that if we are finding cultural relevance and personal connections, um, that gives us perspective. It, get, it, it also locks in our attention and insists us in interpreting and inferring meaning, uh, enabling the depth of understanding and interest needed for what are considered acts of high intellectual processing, such as conceptualizing, reasoning, or theorizing. Um, and this is from Dr. Yvette Jackson, who is the CEO of the National Urban Alliance for Effective Education. Um, Dr. Jackson, uh, and I love this quote by Dr. Jackson um, because what she's saying is that it, it, until this instruction I'm doing is real for me in the here and now, until this makes sense, um, there's no foundation for me to build and to go steps further in that process. Um, and that becomes the real sticking point and the real difficulty for so many of us, even as educators and definitely for our students, is this idea of responding to a new culture of learning um, when it doesn't seem relevant for the everyday lived experiences of our students. Um, and that's in situations of shared culture, many of us having teaching remotely. But even in some more disparate cultural contexts, we have to make this thing alive. So um, a really, really good framework, something that, that we are really proud to have access to as a Chicago company is the equity curve. And the equity curve is a, is a tool um, that is designed by the Chicago Public Schools Equity Framework. Um, what this does is really present this opportunity to recognize spaces where social, certain cultural representation and cultural perspectives have been deprioritized and diminished it gives us this opportunity to recognize these spaces and try to steer our resources, steer our attention to bringing more equity into the way that those cultural perspectives are represented in our instruction. Um, this is really starting with a recognition and understanding. Um, the first is that we have to be curious. Um, and this in and of itself is really, really different, difficult, especially when we acknowledge um, our biases. When we acknowledge both unconscious and conscious biases around what we believe our students' cultural references to be. Um, regardless of your particular background, you're going to have biases, and those biases um, will come out all over the place. Um, but first and foremost, they're going to be in your lesson pre presentation and preparation. Um, that means that we have to be curious about our students. Um, regardless of how long we've been in the classroom, we need to ask ourselves legitimate questions about who our students are and where they're coming from. Um, we have lots of practice um, in trying to assess our students' social locations, um, what their stories are, that's part of our job, 
um, as educators in trying to help our students. And we've honed those skills, but first and foremost, we always want to be curious about where that's coming from. Um, once we're curious, let's be urgent. Um, the fact that you're on the call today lets us know that you believe that this is important to some extent, um, but this is not a project to put on the back burner or off to the side. Um, we understand that all of our students deserve our attention. Uh, all of our students deserve to feel like they belong in learning STEM, so we have to show some urgency there. Um, I want to encourage every, every person on this call to also be resilient. Um, you're going to get this wrong. We at Next Wave STEM are not perfect with this. Um, I have gotten this wrong personally as an educator myself. Um, you're going to mess up trying to understand students and inject and uh, give students space to bring their cultural perspectives into your instruction. Um, be resilient. Um, it is okay to continue to engage that work. Um, and in that same vein, we can be really vulnerable to accept that we don't necessarily have the answer to the solution. Um, this means listening to those voices that you might not have listened to previously. Um, this means understanding in certain situations and maybe many situations, your voice is the one that needs to be heard. That means that you'll have to be vulnerable to accepting leadership roles. Um, vulnerability is a great tool for collaboration and teamwork. Um, collaborating with your staff is gonna help with that. And finally, we just have to be empathetic. Um, and on that same token, we need others to be empathetic with us. Um, you can't give what you don't have. Uh, so as you are showing empathy, we have to communicate with our entire school um, communities, with our partners, whether they're our staff or administrators, um, with our teachers, with our parents, with our overall school community, um, that we've got to recognize and see each other. Just this idea of, of keeping an open mind and moving quickly towards seeing each other and not being afraid to fail when you do it um, changes a lot, not just about instruction, but about what happens in an entire school culture, regardless of the subject matter. Okay, so we, we've got something to pick on here. We wanna start to begin the cultural context of our students and it helps to actually consider the practices of culturally responsive teachers, what they actually do um, to be responsive to their students. Um, the first and foremost thing is the way in which you actually understand and recognize your students from the first time that you meet them. I, I'll, I'll pause here because of how critical an idea this is. Um, the first time you meet your students, the posture that you take to them um, is actually going to inform you a lot about their cultural location, their experiences in school up to that point, um, but also your ability to listen to and receive the cultural context that you want to integrate into their STEM learning. When we're making those introductions on the first day of class, when we run a program at Next Wave STEM and we have instructors getting to know about students, um, what kind of questions are we asking them? Um, are we assuming that because they're located in a particular place that everyone lives in that place or do we take that little bit of extra time? Um, not asking for addresses, mind you, even though we might have them, but asking, where are you from? Um, where what where do you live and where are you from are two different ideas and listening to whether or not our students express pride in answering that question where are you from many people will express pride and be excited but maybe our students don't we have to recognize why that may or may not be um, another important practice of culturally responsive teachers is on top of just that initial introduction is the continual, the continual follow-up. Um, why do you want to learn this? Uh, for our younger students, especially those who are in elementary and middle school, they may not have a great answer to the question. Um, and if they don't have a great answer to the question of why do you want to learn this, um, the different question 
And the different answer they might have is, I don't want to learn this, but what I do want to learn is X, Y, and Z. Um, we have to understand what our students are passionate about and find those hooks. Um, in STEM, I guarantee you, if you understand what your students want to learn about, um, what you will be able to do is the lesson prep that allows you to get into the weeds of the subject along with your students. Um, a perfect example of this is uh, working in the computer science lab back in Detroit Public School. Uh, I had a group of young men, uh, this was an all boys school, a group of young men who were learning about website design. And um, a lot of them were really, really passionate about learning website design because they wanted to get a job, but were absolutely getting bored with the class um, because we're covering basic design things, how to change colors, how to uh, make sure things fit properly. If you resize the web page, will the text run off the side or will it actually respond and fit and look really, really good? Um, this idea of, okay, what do you want to learn? What are you already interested in? What are we talking about? Um, our students and these young high school boys absolutely love fashion. They are, they are passionate about um, athletics, they're passionate about fashion, they're passionate about sneakers. Please believe me that we completely changed our lesson plan to design um, and went away from personal biographies and gave our students the opportunity to design their own sneaker reselling websites. Um, we dug into those things that are important and relevant and created context and we saw engagement in that class jump 150%. We saw productivity skyrocket just because students were in this phase where, okay, I actually care about this and I want to make this look good because it's something that matters to me at that moment. Um, that's a really basic example of something that's going on there, but we also just want to do those two things. We want to give our, our students the ability to actually show us who they are on the very first day. We want to continue to enforce that by really digging in and learning what our students' interests are. In the context of the, of the pandemic, we also have to consider our instructional responses to our actual technical limitations, but also consider what that will mean for the new normal. For one thing, um, we know for a fact that the pandemic has had disproportionate impact on student population. Um, which is also based on their social economic location, but also their social emotional learning. Um, many of our ancillary resources, things like counseling, um, things like being able to receive meals at the schools has been extremely disrupted by this pandemic. Um, the, our best data that we have so far shows that on average in the United States, students have lost an equivalency on average of 12 days of instruction. Um, but that's the average. For our students who are uh, identified as African-American, that number jumps up to 18 days of average lost instructional time. Um, if you are Latino, Latina, that average drop, drops a little bit, but it's still above the national average at 16 days. And then um, when we are considering our home learning and support infrastructure, um, which also ties into things like race and social economic um, location. Um, that is something that really um, will impact our ability for our students to actually connect and make use of the resources that might be available. Um, so the, the struggle here is understanding, um, even in this context, how our different students' social locations and their social economic opportunities um, will continuously affect the way that they're able to interact with us as, as educators. Um, it's, it's been disproportionate. The data shows that there's just no way around that idea. So our response to that has been, especially with respect to STEM, device distribution. Um, and for it, Anyone who's on the line with us who is a librarian or administrator, um, you are doing good, good work. Let me say that for a fact. Students who did not have access to Chromebooks or internet hotspot because of a lack of, of reliable connectivity, 
um, have been able to get devices that allow them to continuously connect with our teachers. It's hard. It continues to be hard. It may continue to be hard going into the future. But we know, we know for a fact that our students um, have been positively impacted by that kind of distribution. Um, but what we've also seen as being really important, and we've seen an, even an up, uptick in this in the summer, is the ability to connect our students hands-on with technology. For our students um, who are doing more generalized STEM education, if you're working through your science and technology class or you're doing a specialized STEM class, or for our students who are engaged in career and technical education, the ability for you to actually work with the equipment and not virtualize or not simulate the equipment makes a big, big deal. Um, we've got to recognize that our students need this stuff in their hands. They need the hard and fast learning on their hands. A lot of this will be remediated um, as we are returning back to school. A huge portion of our adult population has been vaccinated and we're hopeful, continuously hopeful for what that means for our younger students, um, whether they get vaccinations or whether um, there is a lack of effectiveness in the, or a lack of mortality, I should say, in the pandemic for our younger student population. Um, regardless of the reasons why we know that our students are getting hands-on and working with their technology is becoming more important. So cultural context for our students um, in this new normal means not, not only do we need to give them the tools, but we need to teach them how to use the tools. Um, the cultural context that we're gonna be building now is one in which our students just aren't traditional students who happen to be removed from our classrooms, um, but they are students who are um, traditional students and both digital students. Um, if you don't know what it means to be a digital citizen, if that's something you're still growing in, um, if your students don't know what it means to be uh, digital citizens and going in their digital citizenship, um, which includes stewardship and proper usage of technology, whether that's their Chromebooks or internet hotspots or whatever technology kit they have available to them, and that's going to be a part of our curriculum. Um, I appreciate also the ways in which I, we've seen districts across the country respond to this with, with urgency. Um, we understand COPA, the Child Online Protection and Privacy Act, was in place um, years ago. We're seeing SOPA now being taken more seriously by districts all across the country, the Student Online Protection and Privacy Act. Um, do our students know how to actively manage their data? Um, do they know how to really robustly and appropriately um, communicate with our staff, um, but also engage with wider learning communities? Uh, in a future where um, the snow day may be a thing of the past, um, will they and will you know how to respond to being able to do those two different formats um, at the same time? Um, this is going to be now a new part of our learning culture that we have to inject and be, be real about. Um, and we've seen different different levels of, of efficacy, but the, the big difference here is that we're actually putting in the work towards that goal. Um, so we've done a lot of, of high level framework. Let's talk about cultural responsive teaching and what that looks like specifically in STEM context. Um, if you're doing this and you wanna do this in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, where might we begin? What do we need to do? Well, the first thing that we need to think about is who our instructors are and what their goals are. At NextWave STEM, what we've done and what we will continue to do is try the best that we can to really match up our instructor base with our student population. The reason for that is, is twofold. Um, we are actively recruiting STEM professionals who are in these communities um, all over the Chicagoland area and even virtually into other states. And the goal here is to think about the students who need windows and mirrors. Um, this idea, some of you may be familiar with it, of having an instructor who is a window. 
who can show you a pathway to something that you might not have been able to imagine or simply might not have understand it or understood, I should say, understood about your STEM industry. But you're also looking for an instructor who can be a mirror, someone who's really intentional about one, bringing in your image, showing you a little bit more about who you are, allowing you to bring your cultural perspective and just your entire person as a student into the classroom space and reflects a little bit about that themselves. Um, a lot of us are old enough to understand some of the cultural trends and even um, some of the pop culture that some of our students love today. Some of us love that culture as well. Um, I don't love K-pop, but I'm, I'm starting to love it. And so many of our student populations here at Next Day STEM do. Um, there are ways to understand um, and bring that in in our instructor base. On that point, many of you are doing a great job. Uh, many of you have educators who are a part of your local communities, even as their students are becoming more digital, dig, digitized. Um, but beyond that, one thing we do at Next Day STEM is actually pair that personalized instruction with our customized coursework. Um, when we think about technology and think about the technology application into the classroom, it becomes really important to think about the different contexts in which our students will encounter that technology. With respect to something as simple as drone technology, um, if we take a look at the difference between how drones might be used in a rural context, um, where you might see drones used much more agriculturally if they're doing um, things like property surveyor, uh, surveyorship, or they're doing things like public safety tasks, um, surveying fire, uh, wildfires, mm -hmm. or even if they are doing the advanced kind of work of uh, actual irrigation and, um, and pest control via drone. Um, those are some functionalities our students who are more urban, who may have never actually been to a firm before, have never seen before, and for them might not matter at all. But in that same curricula, we also provide examples and directives and even performance tasks that allow our students to imagine applications in more urban contexts. Uh, say you're having a drone making multiple deliveries at different locations in the city. Um, those two uh, simple examples using the same technology allow us to have a curriculum that can touch different cultural contexts. Um, and that is the kind of flexibility that you want in your lesson plan in your design. Um, you want to have the kind of technology and the kind of curriculum that can be responsive to those different social locations. Um, finally, you have to think about holding your students to, to high standards. And even that context of understanding our students' cultural locations. Um, what are our standards as a learning institution? Um, what are we responsible for, whether that be from a social emotional learning perspective, from a high school placement or even college placement perspective, from our standardized assessment, in, including our own internalized um, assessment perspective? And then what are those things that we know are gonna make a difference with respect to our students' soft skills? Um, those things we have to consider as well. So what's really, really cool, going back to this idea of culturally responsive teaching is what we've seen directly from our instructors. Um, part of this is actually, once again, our instructor in this case, uh, Kahari, um, gives our students the space to be creative inside of Tinkercad, which is a part of our 3D design um, program. A lot of this comes down to understanding the capabilities of the technology that you're working with as well. Um, if I know that I'm working with a 3D design software um, that's designed to make objects, how can I then bend that 3D software to design and represent other things? Um, could I use my 3D modeling software um, to be able to then make geographical representations for different neighborhoods? Can we do it for data expression? Um, can we change and warp our views in ways that are both um, expressive of information, but also artistic? 
um, giving students the freedom to explore even off the page of the curriculum is a huge, huge deal. And um, Kari does a great job because I've seen him in action. He gives students the space to speak their mind. Um, you want your instructions to be welcoming of student perspectives. And we see that embodied in this case by getting off the curriculum page. But that's only made possible if you understand the capabilities of your technology, um, which honestly just requires continued professional learning and growth in that particular tool. Um, Paul is actually really, really cool um, because he digs into specifically thinking about the student interests in terms of high and emerging technologies. Um, it's, it's truly amazing to think about the ways that our largest technology firms, the Apples, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, um, the Twitters of the world are so much a part of the cultural landscape of our younger students in ways that they were a, never a part of our cultural cultural landscape. If we grew up in a time where those big internet companies were either much smaller or just didn't exist, we have to leave things open-ended and actually imagine possibilities. Um, something that we love to continue to explore at Next Wave STEM is the ability to leverage these big technology partners to actually make that world, real world learning hands-on. Um, a perfect example is Paul actually simulated in our drone course, um, a delivery to the school using Amazon. And this once again goes back to our professional exposure and professional development. Um, if you're in a market where Amazon does drone deliveries, this is a thing that you can do. You can sign up for Amazon Prime Air. And if you're in that market, Amazon can have a package delivered by a drone to an address in 30 minutes. Um, there's no reason that we can't leverage that kind of service to actually see a live real world application of a drone at our school building. Um, to see that drone come land, drop a, a box off with a book or whatever we'd like to order from Amazon as long as it fits and isn't too heavy. Um, but there's no reason that we can't bring that real world experience to our students and actually give our students the tools to visualize that ahead of time. Um, we keep going back to the 3D printing because of how expansive and open-ended it is as a design tool. Um, students um, are going to be intentional, but they're actually going to jump in and play around and, and try even to uh, break things inside their 3D design. Um, it is really, really interesting to see the ways in which we allow our students to build into their designs what's just natively in their heads. Um, we don't say that it has to be limited to just a specific project. We don't say that it has to comport with our own ideas, uh, especially if you're thinking of the engineering design space. Um, we love engineering design and next wave STEM um, because our students have the ability to solve those problems within constraints. Um, but the thing about constraints is that there's always space within those constraints. Um, understanding things, even as simple as color choice, can make a huge difference when we understand our students' um, cultural context and why are we, why not they may pick certain solutions. Uh, and finally, when we consider um, Coretta, uh, who is teaching both uh, really exclusively virtually classes, um, it becomes really, really cool to find that common language for the students that you have in your classroom. Um, especially in something like drone technology. Most of us on the call today, once again, because we're adults, we're of a particular age, um, we didn't hear the word drone uh, in common language and common context until about 2001. Um, the September 11th attacks really caused that to become a larger part of our uh, everyday lexicon because we were hearing more and more about drones being used in the context of military applica applications. Um, and for some of our students, um, we have to even get to this point where as, as that has stayed into the culture, into the zeitgeist, many of our students 
don't remember 9-11 because they weren't alive. Um, they've got this contest of drones either as toys, but also in this case, as a video game. If we're, if we're making a definition to, to build from, if we're starting out a place where we wanna speak the same language, um, we're able to bring in even gaming. Many of us might not game. I'm not a particular gamer, even myself. Um, but if we know that there's a context here for the technology that we're using, even in their game, it makes sense for us to explore that context, explore that source material and expand from there. Um, if we're talking about drones and rovers and camouflage, um, but primarily talking about drones in the context of a video game, in this case, Call of Duty, we can start talking about the physics. Um, what are the forces being applied um, that allows this drone to fly? How accurate are those forces that are being applied to this drone uh, in this video game as it relates to a drone that you might fly in real life? Let's fly a real drone and compare the two. So we've got this hook here. Um, where are we even able to bring in some resources? Maybe I have clips and footage of this video game drone for us to compare to the real thing in real life. Um, that, that's absolutely critical to making the STEM learning for our students real, that we hook in and understand their cultural context. So what's also useful is understanding where that language does and doesn't work. Um, we have performance tasks and activities and things we design all the time that use words and terminology that our students might not understand. Um, recognizing that and being able to shift away um, is important for cultural responsive teaching. Getting off the book, doing that thing that makes a little bit more sense for the context of our students. It's about intentionality. It's about the intentionality of connecting to where our students are, but also connecting to their populations and ways that they relate to and that they understand. Um, we can't say that with more emphasis, but we wanna make sure that our students know that we're there for a reason. And we want to, as much as possible, um, bring in their cultural perspective. Um, if you can get a hook into the technology from the way that it's used from their, in their everyday culture or in what they can imagine their culture to be, because you've got to at least have a starting point, a baseline. If you've done that work, um, you've now got this opportunity to make that learning relevant for your students as you build your curricula, as you build your lesson planning, as you build those expositional and interrogative and hands-on learning moments. Um, it's all about being responsive to where your students are first. So um, hopefully that's a, a lot to, to, to start with at the very least of cultural responsive teaching. Um, actually hooking our students in and beginning where they are at the very beginning. Um, the big question that you might have at this point is, how can next wave STEM actually help? Um, I mentioned before that we are a company that really is looking to make resources available to you and to your students, regardless of where they are in their STEM journeys. Um, that's important to us because we understand with emerging technology, especially getting hands-on with that technology, many of us are beginners and need that introductory course for us. So we have courses that are designed to go K through 12 and right now three primary technology areas, um, robotics and artificial intelligence being one, but um, um, also drones and computer science, um, just shorthand for coding and 3D technology. And these courses are stratified to allow our students to progress along with these courses, building their skills and getting better as they continue to practice over their grade bands. Um, for us, it's about this really intentional stratification um, of taxonomy, of really what's appropriate for our students. Our K through two learners who are learning about drones and robots, um, they're starting with that very basic um, understanding definition building cause and effect relationships um, when we think about computer science or physics when working with drones. Um, and understanding also, because this part 
portion is often divorced, um, not just what our technology, in their case, drones and robot, robots do, um, but why they're doing them. What's the task? How does it get done? And what's the job becomes really important. For our three through five students, um, many of whom we might traditionally think, okay, this is where you're really going to begin with technology and emerging technologies. Um, the purposes, the applications become really, really important, even if we're not digging into really, really robust understanding of how we get there. Um, they're going to know what the technology does and how it does it, but we want them to be considering beyond thinking about person-to-person -person solutions for engineering and also connections with real-world occupation. For sixth grade students, are actually going to explore and they're going to start analyzing for uses. Um, what they're going to be doing is really considering not only how the technology is going to be used, but ways for them to use the technology better than they have been to come towards solutions. Um, and they have to consider this in the context of effectiveness in the real world, um, but also some speculation about the future. Um, we always want our students to be forward thinking and forward leaning um, with respect to imagining and using emerging technologies. Uh, and then finally, in the 9 12 space in high school, um, our students are going to design solutions that solve real world problems. They're closing the engineering loop in ways that will be applicable to people in the real world. Um, but it's also super important that they're able to evaluate solutions. Um, is this a good way to go about the work that we're doing? Each one of our courses, um, we'd like to think of as an all-in-one turnkey solution where there's access to, of course, the course licenses, that's the course materials, um, all of our lessons, teacher's guides, presentations, student worksheets. Um, but additionally, because we've been virtual for so long, uh, lesson plans uh, and also equipment. We want you to have everything that you need and not have to go through that half of peace knowing your equipment together. Um, but because we are starting, many of us from the beginning, um, that means that we have to provide the tools and resources for you to teach with fidelity. Um, that's half day intensive training for the curriculum. Um, for equipment and implementation. Uh, and that's customizable as well. Um, but also um, access to our learning management system. So things are easy for you to uh, actually organize or for you to implement on your end. And everybody gets a certificate of completion. We want your students to actually feel that that time was meaningful as they've been working with Next Safe STEM. Finally, something that's really important to us is that if you are not right now in that position to deliver courses on your own, even with your professional development, we can be a resource for you in the instructor space as well. Um, not only in the Chicagoland area, but beyond. Um, we have certified STEM instruct instructors who work with us um, and they are delivering classroom instruction to your students. Um, even if your students are in person, we understood now that there are ways for us to empower you with the equipment that you need to get hands on, and our instructors are there to guide your students through. Um, we want solutions that will work in any kind of format, whether that's in person or hybrid or remote. Um, we try to be there for you in all situations, as much as we can be. So lots of information over the last 54 minutes. Uh, we've got a couple minutes here at the end. And I want to pause for some questions. I see one actually up in the chat from a while ago from um, Anna. Yes, Anna, that SEO question. Um, if you type that in Google, you'll get search engine optimization. In the context of our talk today, SEO stands for social, social, um, socioeconomic opportunity. Um, basically, how much does a student's family's um, social economic location allow them to dig into other resources. If that's um, test prep or um, individual or small group tutoring, or to purchase those technology kits on their own, or to go to things like STEM, STEM summer camps. Um, those, those things really add up for our students and have made a big difference in the context of the pandemic. Um, that's part of the reason why 
Um, not the only reason why by any means, but that's one of the stories for the reason why we've seen those learning loss disparities in the past year. Um, we wanna make sure um, that we can do as much as we can um, to bring some equity into that space. So yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question there. SEO is a socioeconomic opportunity. Um, are there any other really good questions? That was a really good one. I'll just pause for a little bit because I know those fingers are flying across keyboards. Anna, you might uh, have winner, winner, chicken dinner. I think you might have the only question of our webinar today, um, but that is perfectly fine. Um, you might be ruminating over your questions. You may wake up in the dead of night saying, oh, I should have asked Desmond that question from before. Um, fortunately, my email is really, really easy. I am Desmond at nextwavestem.com. Um, you can also connect with us uh, via any social platform. Um, that can be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. I should bring that back. Not any social platform. We're not on TikTok. I neither tick nor do I talk, but we might figure out an intern to take care of that for us this summer. Um, connect with us. We love digging into the weeds and we will gladly even connect you with a school um, partnership specialist to help with that as well. Um, to all of you who were able to join us today, thank you so, so, so much. Um, we're asking that you stay safe, and be well, um, we're hopeful for this new summer and the new season and things, um, good things that we'll bring. Um, until then, thank you so much. And we will be speaking with you all soon. Bye-bye, everyone.